Thanks, Susan. All right. Thanks, folks. It's always great to see Susan, an old friend. Well, I don't say old, a, a long standing friend. We say we get some of these things from our days when we were museum directors together up in Maine and, and fellow bas basset hound aficionados, too. So um, it seems that this is a very topical story. Um, and uh, my wife said, now you're not going to talk about politics, are you? But frankly, since I was just quoted extensively in a long article about witch hunts in the Washington Post that came out last night, um, we will talk a little bit about witch hunts, I suppose, too, as well as witch trials, because they both seem to be relatively relevant uh, over a fairly long period of time. Um, so what I want to try to do, and the reason I kind of wrote my book, was to try to put Salem's witch trials in context. And also, by the way, to straighten out all the nonsense that we hear about it, particularly uh, having taught at Salem State now for in my 26th year, um, we hear a lot of really interesting stories about what some of the tour guides said happened in 1692. And frankly, that's one reason why I, I wrote this book. But I think the first thing to do is, 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 to, is to give that context, because you know, wherever I go in the world, and I tell them I teach at Salem State, people immediately say, oh, the witch city. I've had friends who've been in the middle of a, of a safari in Africa, and they said, oh, you're from the witch city. Like, wow. So, you know, here's the point. Salem is just part of a much larger story of, of witch hunts. We know during the great age of witch hunts in Europe and their American colonies, about 100,000 people were tried for witchcraft between about 1400 and the American Revolution. About half of them were executed. The numbers are so large and round because, frankly, we don't know. We don't know all the names because the executions were so vast. In, in Cologne, Germany, for example, is, is the largest known witch hunt in uh, Western Europe. And in a decade, starting in 1626, about 2,000 people were executed for witchcraft, right? So we don't even know all of their names. Now, by comparison, Salem kind of gets a bad rep because in Salem, we have 172 dead, 19 executed, one pressed to death, five died in jail awaiting trial. I by no means mean to diminish those numbers. As a matter of fact, one of the people who died in prison was a ninth great uncle of mine, a fellow named Dr. Roger Toothaker. Um, but at the same time, too, by European standards, this is kind of a fly spec. It's not even a moderately sized witchcraft outbreak. So, so one of the questions I wanted to try to explore is, why Salem? We know, in fact, actually, that there were executions in Europe. In Hungary alone, in the 18th century, after the Salem witch trials, 800 people were executed for witchcraft in Hungary alone. So people, sometimes people say, well, Tad, you know, Salem may have not been the, the, the largest, but it was the last. It was no, by no means the last. Matter of fact, even in the United Kingdom, the last witch is executed in 1697 in Scotland. And also, I like to point out that even by New England standards, Salem is a latecomer. And maybe that's part of the story because it is so late. These are the last executions for witchcraft. But in fact, by 1692, there had already been about 100 people tried for witchcraft in New England, and a few of them had, in fact, been executed. And since we're in Newbury, I like to point out that one of the most famous cases, and to me one of the most intriguing of those, is the case of Elizabeth Morse, who lived uh, in Newbury at the time, which is actually now part of Newburyport, and you can, you can see the plaque. Uh, well, actually, can we turn those lights down a little more, maybe, up there? If possible. If not, people can hopefully see that. But if you can read that plaque, it points out right off of Market Square, in present-day Newburyport is where, uh, where she actually lived. Um, and it's actually interesting because she's found guilty in 1681 after several years of trials. And after being found guilty and initially sentenced in, uh, to be executed, they kind of give her a stay of execution and essentially place her under house arrest for the rest of her life. She lives about another 10 years. Um, which is to say by the 1680s, people have their doubts, not about whether witchcraft is real, because everybody in the 17th century knew witchcraft was real. Kings, emperors, Ministers, popes, everybody knew witchcraft was real, right? Because witchcraft is a power that Satan gives to people who are his witches. Satan is created by God. So if you doubt witches, it's a slippery slope, isn't it? Are you going to start questioning whether Satan exists? And if you question that, are you going to challenge God's existence, right? So everybody knows witches are real. The tough part, as we'll see, is how do you prove someone's a witch? That's sort of the tough part. Anyhow, so I, I do talk a little bit about the Morse case, which is a case of what we call lithobolia, a stone-throwing demon uh, that assaulted the Morse house uh, in, in my book, The Devil of Great Island, which is about this bizarre case of lithobolia where a, um, 
A debauched Quaker tavern in Portsmouth, New Hampshire is supernaturally assaulted by flying stones throughout the summer of 1682. And by the way, one reason I wrote this book was because that sentence I just said sounds nothing like what you learned about Puritan 17th century New England, does it? Debauched Quaker tavern, supernaturally throwing stones, and attacking their widowed Anglican next door neighbor being a witch? Wow. New England in the 17th century was a much more diverse place, and by studying witchcraft, you can kind of get a sense of that. Well, anyhow, so that is, Salem is not the first, it's not the last, but it is the most infamous in American history. And I, and I tried to figure out why that was, and I'll talk a little bit about that tonight at times, but I think, I think uh, it's clear that Salem is, the more you look at it, is really a, a critical turning point in American history. And I'm not just saying that because my book, A Storm of Witchcraft, was published by Oxford University Press in their Pivotal Moments in American History series. I genuinely feel that something strange and, and, and happened in, in Salem. And frankly, one reason historians love studying witchcraft, because historians are obsessed with understanding change and change over time. And witchcraft is a, certainly a symptom of changing times. Um, but think about this. In many ways, the Salem witch trials are that last great gasp of Puritanism in New England, where Cotton Mather, the, the great theologian and, and son of, of Increase Mather, uh, the two really last great Puritan divines, Cotton Mather really kind of ruins his career in really defending the actions of the witch trial court, and with it, I think, begins to discredit Puritanism itself. It's also the beginning of our distrust, distrust in government, not the least of which because the governor who's leading these, these, ex, these trials, uh, his top advisors in the colony are the ministers. Back then, there was no division in church and state, but I really think after 25 innocent lives were lost, people began to think it might be good to put some distance between these two. And really, that will start to happen even in New England uh, within, within a generation. I also think that what happened in 1692 was a complete failure of the government to protect innocent lives. Right? Um, before the trials were over, people know, knew, even if they couldn't admit publicly, that innocent lives had been lost. And in that sense, it actually turns out being the first real cover-up, official government cover-up in American history. So again, we're going to be talking about witch hunts and cover-ups, and, and I guess we're going to miss Anderson Cooper's show tonight, but that's what we'd be hearing on that anyhow, right? Um, and also, too, though, Salem is a very different pattern of accusation because, as, as we'll find out, witchcraft is usually a working-class crime. Elizabeth Morris, pretty much working-class woman, and those are the people usually accused of witchcraft. But in Salem, we actually have... Increase Mather's wife, the leading minister in the colony, accused of witchcraft. A dear friend of hers, Lady Mary Phipps, the wife of the governor, accused of witchcraft. We have representatives to the general court, the Massachusetts legislature, accused of witchcraft. Um, so it's a different time, and the accusations really go up the social ladder and out. Well, so what happened? Well, I, you know, of course, my easy to answer to that is buy the book and copies available after the talk, but... Um, <laughs> I want to try to sort of give you a sense of what happened, and, and maybe you can take the biggest takeaway you can have from that is, I call it a storm of witchcraft, because it really was this perfect storm uh, that I equate to that other great Essex County tragedy, of course, the loss of the fishing fleet to the perfect storm. You need a large number of bad things to come together to take which was by far the largest outbreak of witchcraft in, uh, in American history. In most other times, you'll have one or two people accused. But in Salem, you have like 170. Wow, something significantly different happened. So what are the factors that created all these accusations? Well, long-standing factionalism in Salem Village. Now, hopefully most of you folks realize that where the action really took place, Salem Village, is today the present-day town of Danvers, right. which at the time was part of Salem, and that was part of the problem because the people in Salem Village wanted to hire their own minister, become their own town, and they weren't really given full authority to do that. They were allowed to hire a minister, but they still were part of Salem, and it was a sort of a, a messy situation, one that created all kinds of factionalism in Salem. Suffice it to say, by 1692, uh, Salem Village had had a minister for 20 years, and by 1692, they were on their fourth minister. Now, normally, ministers in New England towns come and spend their entire careers, maybe 30, 40, 50 years, in the same pulpit. But clearly, there was discontent in Salem Village. And by the way, the, uh, really, uh, one of the truly outstanding books on this is sort of my historiographical note for the students in the audience. Uh, Boyer and Nissenbaum's book, Salem Possessed, 
published in 1974, The Social Origins of Witchcraft, looks at this conflict in Salem Village. And it's a really good analysis of that, but it doesn't go much further than that. And my point is, you have people from throughout Eastern Massachusetts who were accused of witchcraft in 1692, right? You have more people accused in Andover than any other town. So clearly this is not just a Salem Village thing, even if that's where it started. And of course, yes, the trials and the executions do take place in what is present day Salem, which somehow means that's why we got stuck with haunted happenings rather than Danvers <laughs> or Andover, right? Okay, so in addition to the problems in Salem Village, you've got colony-wide political instability. Um, we know that, that there's gonna, a new governor who's going to be uh, arriving. There's questions about what is going to happen with the charter, the new government that he brings from England. What does that mean? People are very worried about that. They're on edge. And it's months before the governor actually shows up. And by the time he shows up in May, the jails are full with people accused of witchcraft. This takes place amid the the perceived decline in Puritanism, what uh, scholars call Puritan declension. Um, there's this thought that uh, the first generation of Puritans who arrived in Massachusetts in the 1630s came here to create that perfect Christian utopian community, right? This, this city upon a hill, God's perfection. Um, and that unfortunately their children and their grandchildren, as so often the case, want to be good, good members of the family, but they lack that kind of that fire in the belly that their parents do, no matter how hard they try. And not as many of them attend church as regularly as they should. And some of them are becoming very successful merchants and businessmen and farmers, and they're making lots of money. And they're being sort of tempted by that wealth to maybe not be as devout. And to maybe, when they go to the tavern, maybe it's not just one and done like it should, because Puritans drank, and they smoked tobacco pipes, and they made merry, but you know, it was like one and done, right? Because like, as I tell to my daughters who are now 20-somethings, but when they were uh, of, of, of uh, prep school age, I, I used to say to them, remember girls, home by midnight, you know, because nothing good happens, especially in a tavern after midnight. Right? <laughs> now I think it's perceived decline, because I think actually Puritanism was doing pretty good. But, if, but to the Puritans, where everything is a sign of God's pleasure or displeasure, all the things that were happening bad in the colony re reinforced their concerns that their children and their grandchildren were not living up to the covenant that they'd made with God. And that as a result, God was terribly angry and he was going to wreak vengeance, right? We're talking about that Old Testament biblical vengeance of Yahweh, right? This is not the God of love and mercy. This is Yahweh who is going to get you if you don't do as he says and worship properly. And as a sign, one sign of God's displeasure was the fact that people were achieving or suffering through in the late 1680s and 1690s the absolute worst weather in human memory. Um, we now know now it was, the, it was the worst weather of the Little Ice Age, which took place in the, in the Northern Hemisphere between roughly about uh, 1400 to 1800. And uh, the, the, the time known as the Maunder Minimum, the absolute worst time of the Little Ice Age, was right in this time period. We we're talking about horrible winters. We we're talking about killer frosts as soon as, you, as things get planted, which wipes out the crops. Hot, dry summers, which again, tends to wipe out crops. Frost in August, if any plants have survived. So you're talking about starvation, you're talking about crop failure, you're talking about inflation. And of course, people don't understand meteorology back then. All of this is a sign of God's displeasure and the fact that he has set Satan loose in their colony. Is that isn't bad enough, there's a war going on the frontier between the Native Americans and the French against the English, and they are destroying the English settlements in northern New England. And uh, that's not a good sign either, right? You have population displacement, people from Maine and New Hampshire who come down to escape as refugees with nothing but the clothes on their back. Taxes go up to pay for all of this. Families have to take in distant cousins and relatives, even though they don't have room for them, and to feed them, and to find jobs for those teenage sons who are eating them out in house and home now. So it was a really bad time. And all those factors contributed to the witch trials. But the one thing that didn't, by the way, folks, not ergot poisoning. We'll get to that. I'll just, we'll just, don't, I'll just cut off that question right now. So, again, I think this is a, still a critical turning point in American history. And um, I think the other important thing too is it's something that people refuse to forget, as we'll see. And I think that's because this is our disaster, right? That there were, that there were people 
John Winthrop came to found a city upon a hill, right? His famous sermon, A Model of Christian Charity, that at the time actually was probably preached in Salem or on his way to Salem because, as hopefully all of us know in Essex County, the first settlement of Massachusetts Bay, not Plymouth, that's a different colony, not Boston, but Salem, right? And so when they first arrive, Salem kind of is the city upon a hill. Yet within the life of people who had heard that sermon, we have mother accusing grandmother of witchcraft. We have brother accusing brother. We have neighbor accusing neighbor. Look how far we have fallen. And I think it is that huge gulf between the ideal of the city upon the hill and witchcraft accusations that we really never let ourselves forget. And by the way, if we wouldn't, we have a lot of other people around the world that wouldn't either, right? Okay, so everyone always asks me, all right, well, enough about this. What caused all these afflictions and accusations? Well, it is a, it is a long, complicated story. I had to put up an image there of Black Phillip, one of my favorite animals in, uh, in, in movies. If you have not seen the movie The Witch, it is a really wonderful depiction of a 17th century case of witchcraft in New England, probably the 1630s. It is about the best design set I have seen to recreate life in the 17th century. It really looks like, and they actually had consultants from Plymouth Plantation and elsewhere to design the set. And it really is a pretty good depiction of witchcraft. So um, it's a horror story, it's mildly gory, but I'm one of these people that you know, kind of go like this when I see bloodshed in movies. It isn't that bad, but it, if you want to see a really good depiction full of 17th century vocabulary to the point where you may have to rewind the video a few times to actually understand what they're saying, I highly recommend it. I think, again, that there is no single culprit, right? Because we are talking about a perfect storm of many factors. There is no magic bullet that explains this. I think the most prevalent, the most important factor is what we now recognize as mass conversion disorder, what used to be known uh, under the gendered term of mass hysteria, right? But mass conversion or disorder is, uh, is hard to diagnose even today. Uh, I'm not a clinician, nor do I play one on television. Uh, so I, I'm, I kind of go out on a limb a little bit in trying to understand the symptoms of people who've been dead for 300 years. Um, but if you look at mass conversion disorder, what happens in mass conversion disorder is you have mental stresses that uncontrollably convert, hence conversion disorder, into physical symptoms. Um, think about this. Our minds, I think, I don't, still don't think we, we understand uh, the way mind, human mind works, right? It's a pretty powerful and wonderful thing that we're still trying to sort out. But you have, if, you're, if you have someone, especially a, a, a young girl or a young man, who's so overwhelmed and fraught with, with panic and anxiety and concern about the future in the strange world that is 1692 in New England, sometimes that mental anguish will physically convert itself into symptoms. This is not faking. People have no control over this. They don't understand why it's happening. Why all of a sudden do I want to throw myself into the fireplace? Why am I barking like a dog? Why can't I see? Why am I having hysterical blindness? Why does it feel like someone's sticking 100 pins into me? And not even knowing this makes that worse because it's fueled by the anxiety, right? Um, so this isn't acting out or faking. This is, this is the, the mind has taken over. You are so upset and you don't even realize it. Now, interesting, with mass conversion disorder, one thing we do know now the target population, maybe 70 to 80% of the victims at least, are teenagers, especially girls. Um, if, if we, and again, I have, I have two daughters who made it into, into their 20s successfully, but uh, being an only child and uh, uh, not having uh, sisters growing up, uh, I got to see with my daughters how tough it was for, 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 for young women to grow up today in the United States with a huge amount of expectations that are placed on you. And when I saw my first Barbie doll, I thought, oh my God, really? This is kind of like the standard, huh? This is what we're supposed to try to, you know, uh, live up to, dear God. Uh, but in the 17th century, it was even worse, folks, right? Because it was a patriarchal society where children and women, really, were meant to be seen and not heard. You didn't even have legal rights, really, to speak of. Um, and, and the men really ran everything, right? So it was a kind of repressive society, especially for young girls. Mass conversion disorder usually starts out amongst high-status girls. There was a case in uh, Leroy, New York, in upstate New York, maybe eight or 10 years ago now, very famous case, uh, that started out amongst the cheerleaders at the local high school. And, in, uh, and, in, and of course, in many high schools, it's the cheerleaders that are at the top of the social pecking order, right? How about Salem Village? 
The first two to become afflicted are uh, like the 10-year-old and 12-year-old daughter and niece of Reverend Paris, his, his daughter Betty and his niece Abigail Williams. And again, in a small Puritan village, who are the most socially prominent girls? The minister's daughters. And then from that, once they get it, it spreads down and out amongst that population. So um, I think that may explain some of the first accusations uh, in Salem and the first to be afflicted by witchcraft. But it certainly doesn't explain it all by a long shot. And in light of that particularly, again, I want to point out that not only was Massachusetts a patriarchal society, but witchcraft throughout time is a gendered crime. Throughout time and place, different societies, and by the way, witchcraft is pretty much of a universal throughout most places in times in world history, right? And to some degrees, one person's witchcraft is another person's magic, is someone else's religion, right? Um, but in most of these cases, about three quarters of the people accused are women. Uh, in Salem, it's actually about 76%, right? And, um, the number is actually higher than that if you think about it because a large percentage of the men who are accused of witchcraft are family members of women who've been accused of witchcraft. By the way, witchcraft is believed to travel in families. Um, or men who have who've had the, the nerve, the temerity to defend women, their neighbors and friends who have been accused of witchcraft, right? So, most of the group of people known as the afflicted girls in Salem in 1692. And I put it in quotes because, in fact, actually, uh, we know that uh, there was at least uh, one adult male and Native American um, slave. Uh, and also, there was a son of one of the judges. So there were some men involved. But, and there were, there were a couple of women aged about 40. But for the most part, the afflicted is this group of a dozen or so sort of core girls between the ages of about 12 and 19 or 20 who are the ones who do most of the, the accusations of, of affliction, of spectral evidence. Um, but having said that too, it wasn't all about people's specters, people's spirits supposedly causing harm. Many men testified about more traditional kinds of witchcraft. And again, I think because of Salem, we think it's all about someone's ghost or specter or spirit harming you, right? Um, and of course, the trick with that is no one else can see it, right? It's like, oh, oh, man, oh, Susan, stop it, stop it, she's choking me, stop it, no! What do you, what do you mean? Susan's down there in the front, it's her spectacles, oh, oh. <laughs> That's spectral evidence. That's how we arrest people for witchcraft. I know what you're thinking. Hmm, that's not really good evidence, is it? They had concerns about it in 1692, but not for the reasons we'll consider. Um, but for others, maybe we'll, maybe we'll talk about that. It was kind of considered iffy. But anyhow, um, most of, there were many men who testified to more traditional acts of witchcraft. Uh, for example, um, witches were accused of causing lightning strikes on houses, causing huge storms that caused ships to, to sink at sea, uh, caused people's cows to dry up and stop producing milk, uh, caused all sorts of havoc. Uh, amongst the neighborhood, crops to fail, et cetera, et cetera. Um, poppets, right? Poppets. Poppets is an English word for dolls, right? Remember Mrs. Doubtfire? Hello there, poppets! Little, little ones, little children, little dolls, right? Poppets, technically, in, in, in 17th century New England, in England, mean what we would consider to be a voodoo doll, right? Take your know, image magic. Um, it's not Caribbean magic, it's good English magic, where you make a doll kind of in someone's image, get a lock of their hair or a piece of their clothes, and then stop, stab it and pin with it into them, and bang, they, you know, even if they're 10 miles away, they scream in pain. Um, there were actually some poppets produced in trial in Salem in 1692. And actually, one woman said, Right, yes, exactly, I made that poppet, and I did so to protect myself against a witch, because I knew she was out to get me, and the only way I could get her was to get her first. That's magic. Some would say it's white magic because you're doing it to help people, to protect people. Now, here's the problem, folks. A minister would say, I'm sorry, you're not asking God to protect you. You're asking Satan to protect you. You've committed an act of magic. And even if you do it to try to heal someone or help them find a lost object, you are just as guilty as witchcraft as that witch who was trying to kill people. So there's lots of different types of, of witchcraft and magic. And by the way, you, we all know this, at least people of my generation. I don't know if you kids do this today now or not, but you know, when I was a kid, you'd only do it once a year, you'd watch The Wizard of Oz, right? 
You know, you knew the Wicked Witch of the West was evil because she was dressed in black, but Glinda, the Good Witch of the North, you knew she's dressed in white, she's trying to help people. Dorothy, let me help you find the way home. She's a white witch. She's a good witch. But she still uses witchcraft, right? Those ruby slippers got a lot of power in them. Anyhow, so men are very much involved in witchcraft as well, too. And again, usually witchcraft starts off with the usual suspects, which usually are the older, sometimes poor women in town, who often get in trouble by cursing at their neighbors. You know, I hope you won't, oh, what do you mean you won't let me borrow any cheese? I hope your cow dies. Well, you know, a week later, if the cow dies, ooh. Right? It's things like that that got Susanna Martin of Amesbury accused, tried, convicted of witchcraft in 1692. And here's the, uh, the memorial to uh, near, it's actually at the end of, the, northern, the southern end of North Martin Street in Amesbury. Um, in fact, actually, the road was cut in half when they put in 495, and this marker was at the side of the house, which actually is in the middle of 495 today. So every time I go down 495 through Amesbury, I always, I always think of, uh, of poor Susanna Martin. Um, but uh, she, was, she was typical. She'd been accused of witchcraft more than 30 years earlier for the first time. And a lot of the people accused at Salem have been accused in previous times. And that is to say, people always know witches are present. Right? But it's only at certain times of crises, crop failure, uh, bad things happening through the colony, that people begin to say, you know, I'll bet you that Susanna Martin's at it again, and I think it's time we arrested her. And once you've arrested one person for witchcraft, people start thinking, oh yeah, let's think of these others, right? So again, the outbreak spreads up, outward and upward. I do put a lot of the blame on the afflicted girls, but to, to, in their defense, they led very tough, stressful lives. Um, as I say, most of these ones are in their late teens. Most of them are household servants working for someone else. Quite a few are war refugees from Maine. Some of them are orphans who have lost, or someone who have lost at least a father or one parent to the frontier wars. Some have brothers off fighting on the war. And the classic case here, actually, is a young woman named Mercy Short, who lost most of her family in the spring of 1690 when Salmon Falls, present-day Berwick in South Berwick, Maine, is destroyed by a combined French and Native American force during King William's War, this horrible war that New England was in the middle of and losing badly at the time of the Salem Witch Trials. Um, and in fact, she had been taken prisoner that day. Her father and mother had been killed by Native Americans, uh, as had not many of her brothers and sisters. She and a couple of siblings and other neighborhood kids are marched north to Canada overland in March, pretty rough going, where she's forced to convert to Catholicism and sign the church register to that, to that effect. She's eventually ransomed by Governor Phipps uh, when he tries to invade Quebec unsuccessfully in this continuing bad war. Uh, and she ends up being a lowly household servant in Boston. And her prospects of a, of a good life are gone, right? She had a, what we might consider to be a very middle class existence. They wouldn't have recognized that in 1692. But her, fa her family had a couple hundred acres of land. They were sturdy yeoman farmers. She probably might have thought she could grow up and marry that cute farm boy next door and have a family. But those thoughts are gone. She is a miserably poor serving girl with no prospects because no one's going to want to marry a poor serving girl in the class society that is Massachusetts, except for maybe like a servant boy. And that's not a very pretty life that awaits you. And when she finally is sent by her mistress to the prison in Boston to deliver some food to uh, someone who's there, probably a friend who'd been accused of witchcraft, uh, Mercy has an altercation with one of the accused witches and the witch curses her at which point Mercy essentially freaks out. And um, she uh, is try her, her minister, Cotton Mather, conveniently in Boston, tries to heal her. And he says, uh, he describes, he says, Mercy, tell me, you know, how did Satan tempt you? And she says, Satan was a tawny man. He looked like an Indian. And she goes on to essentially relive that attack on her family when her life in many ways ended. Uh, and, and, and describe it in terms of Satan and the Native Americans as his, as his evil minions, right? Um, in essence, if you read her case, it's a pretty clear case of uh, PTSD, right? And, I, and honestly, I think if you lived in this war zone where, frankly, 
Uh, you could, places as nearby here, like as, as Haverhill, Andover, Billerica were attacked. You never knew when you were going to be next. They actually, they, people were in a panic. They thought Gloucester was being attacked in the summer of 1692. Turns out it wasn't, but they still swore they saw French soldiers and guns going off, right? So people were just in a, in a panic. And uh, again, mercy is just one of many examples of this. Also, it's clear that these afflicted girls had, I think, had suffered from verbal, certainly from verbal abuse and probably physical abuse. Now again, really hard to prove. If you want to check this out, there's almost a thousand documents on the Salem witch trials that survive. There are transcriptions of them. There are photographs of every page. If you just Google University of Virginia Salem witch trials, you can get to the transcripts and the records and you can see for yourself. Um, and you know, it's, it's, it's not direct evidence, but isn't it really interesting that in 1692, these afflicted girls are testifying against their masters, particularly that their master's specter or spirit is attacking them, beating them. Uh, and, and interestingly, first, most of these men had history of violence, right? Uh, and also too, of course, in the 17th century, a little physical violence on your family, cuffing around the kids or the indentured servant, absolutely permissible, right? You don't beat them to death. Um, and some degrees, you don't want to have to use too much force uh, because that's, that's a sort of a sign of shame that you don't have a, a well-ordered family. And a Puritan's family was the most important thing. It was what John Demos has called that little commonwealth, that center of, of life, right? Um, but most, so most of these men, though, did have history of, of violence. John Willard, executed for witchcraft. There's actually depositions taken during the witch trials talking about how he beat his wife, um, which may explain why his, his wife's father testified against him for witchcraft, right? George Burroughs, maybe the most famous, the former minister of Salem Village, a uh, fellow who escapes the war on the frontier where, at the time where he's minister in uh, Portland, what's now Portland, Maine, in Wells, Maine, brought back for trial. Interesting, his, he is married to his third wife in 1692. Now that's not out of the uncommon. You know, a lot of people died young, especially women, a high percentage of them died in childbirth. So it wasn't that unusual for, for poor Burroughs to be on his third wife. But the afflicted girls claimed that the ghosts of his dead wives appeared to them in their mourning shrouds covered in blood. That is the mourning shrouds, the, the cloth that you're buried in, right? And they said, George murdered us. Make him stop. Interesting, we do know that he is known for his supernatural strength and also for his controlling ways. One of those wives, he wouldn't let her write home to her father unless he, he had to read the letter first and censor it, right? So, so a really controlling, muscular guy. And again, his specters is, 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 is harming people and the afflicted girls are seeing his, his widow saying, he killed us. Giles Corey, one of the most interesting characters in the witch trials. People love to learn about Giles Corey because of course he is the poor 80 year old who is pressed to death. He pleads not guilty and then refuses to accept. He was pressed to death because he refused to plead. He did. He pled not guilty. Next step of the proceeding. Do you accept, Mr. Corey, a trial by the country? That is, a trial by jury of your peers. And he just zipped his lips and wouldn't say anything. Giles Corey was a cantankerous old guy. He'd seen everyone else who pled not guilty before him be quickly tried, sentenced, and executed. And he was having none of it. So he ends up being pressed to death where they literally try to press a plea out of him. And that, that gains a fair amount of sympathy for, for Giles Corey, but Giles Corey was, you know, no one deserves to be pressed to death, okay? Giles Corey was not a nice guy. Um, in 1675, there was a court case where he used, his, uh, used a stick to severely beat his young, quote, simple-minded servant, the deeds re refer to, um, J Jacob Goodell. And he beat him so severely that the poor fellow died a couple days later. Under the circumstances, Corey was convicted and fined for really what we'd call manslaughter. He kind of got away with murder, really. Um, interesting, isn't it? In 1692, it's Giles Corey's apparition. By this time, he's a crippled old man, and he walks on canes. His apparition beats the girls with his cane or his staff. Do I think that's a coincidence? Not at all. And can I prove it beyond reasonable doubt? Eh, probably not. John Proctor, famous from The Crucible, which again is a great play, but really horrible history. Um, 
Abigail Williams is not his servant. She's actually 10 years old. He's 60 at the time, uh, married to his third wife, who's pregnant. There is no sexual relationship between the two. However, there is something interesting going on between his real servant, Mary Warren. She accuses John Spector of threatening violence against her. And in fact, John Proctor admits, says to a neighbor, he says, I'm going to go fetch, fetch her and thresh the devil out of her to whip the nonsense out, right? Um, his specter even threatens Mary with hot fire tongs. And not coincidentally, John Proctor admits to threatening to burn her out of her fit, out of her affliction. And in fact, actually, she does snap out of it for, for a few days. And he even calls Mary his jade, which in the 17th century is a real off-color term. It can mean a broken down horse, like a nag, but it also means a, a, a woman of dubious morality, maybe even a street walker. Huh? So kind of icky to think of this 60-year-old guy with lots of kids and a pregnant wife referring to his 20-year-old servant girl as his jade. Um, and even, here's the, here's the piece that's really interesting. Amongst the other things that Mary Warren talks about is John's specter afflicting her and bothering her. But there's this one really interesting scene where Mary is sitting, and I think she's reading in a chair, and John Proctor's specter approaches her, and Mary grabs the specter and pulls John Proctor's specter onto her lap. That is really disturbing to me, right? I know it's the specter, it's not John Proctor, but just think about it, right? And also, too, if she'd actually said it was John Proctor, wow. That would have just been unacceptable to Puritan society. So we've talked about conversion. We talked about PTSD, abuse, war hysteria because of that frontier war. But that doesn't explain it all. And there certainly was some fraudulent things going on there, probably more than we want to admit. Because here's the thing. After June 10, 1692, all bets are off. Because that is when the first execution takes place, when poor Bridget Bishop is executed for witchcraft. And by this time, if people had had PTSD and they were starting to recover, or if they had had some sort of mass conversion disorder, Mary Warren even at one point said, oh my God, I, I don't know what, I, what was wrong with me. Uh, and these girls here, they're, they're sick, you know? And then they start, what do they do? They start accusing Mary Warren of being a witch, at which point she decides she's afflicted. So, but here's the point, after June 10th, you can't go back because you're responsible for the death of, of a person. So you have to play along, right? And that's where people start faking it as well. So all of those are factors, but again, no, ergot poisoning was not the culprit. To, to review, if you haven't heard this, because people always say, you know, there was something they ate that made them have like bad trips, right? No, well, so um, ergot is a natural forming mold that gets on, on rye when it's stored improperly and gets wet. And rye, important crop, is what people used to make their bread in Massachusetts in the 17th century. And it, that mold has a natural LSD that it produces, right? But this isn't the case of the girls having a bad trip, right? Because first off, think about this. I've talked about an afflicted girl in Boston, in Andover, it's a bunch of them, in Salem Village. Are they all eating from the same bad grain supply? And if so, why are they the only members of their family that has the affliction, right? So from, from that pattern, it does, doesn't make sense. We should have had the whole, all of Salem Village going crazy and having bad trips, right? I should point out this, this idea was put, first put forward in the early 70s, around the days of Dr. Timothy Leary and experimentation with LSC in the psychedelic 60s and 70s. Um, but also, too, doctors have proven that there are multiple types of ergot poisoning. And there's only one that has, gives you a bad trip or a trip of any kind. And um, it's, it's some, sometimes called the necrotizing ergot or dry rot. Uh, and with it, what happens, as you see up here in this picture on the right, is your limbs, your arms and legs, blacken, shrivel, fall off, you die. None of, nothing like this was described in 1692. Uh, and in fact, because you see, once you start ingesting a poison like ergot, you keep getting worse and worse and worse. And the girls in Salem Village would be fine one day, and then they'd see one of the accused, one of the witches, and they'd start having attacks. So it, doesn't, it really doesn't make, make sense there. And we also know that only, um, all but all of one or two of these girls lived long, apparently fairly, relatively normal lives after the witch trials, at least long lives. They didn't all die from ergot poisoning. So it just doesn't make sense. Uh, nor do I believe things like encephalitis or Lyme disease. Um, there is, again, is, that say, is it possible that one person out of 
like the 20 or 30 that were afflicted had one of these diseases? Yeah. Does it explain the whole outbreak? Absolutely not. Okay, Tad. Well, it wasn't that, but no, it was to get other people's land, right? No. Sorry. Um, in 1692, actually, a felon's personal possessions could be seized if they were convicted of a capital crime like witchcraft. Right? But only their personal possessions, their movable goods, clothes, livestock, furniture. Even if you're executed for witchcraft, your land, your house, pass to your heirs. So, hey, if I accuse my neighbor, I can get his property and I'll get the finder's fee. No. By the way, too, if property, if assets were seized, then as now, it's the government who gets all the assets, right? So there's no finder's fee. Um, so that doesn't really explain, that doesn't explain anything. That doesn't mean that there weren't disputes between neighbors. That certainly is a contributing cause, right? But it wasn't to get their land. Nope. So I think one of the key factors in the witch trials amongst this, these afflictions, are the judges themselves. And in, in my book, I talk a lot about the judges um, because all of the problems going on in the colony make the judges presume guilt from the start. They know Satan is present. First day of the first questioning of one of the first accused, Sarah Good, the first questions, they have pretrial hearings. This is English law. You have hearings to determine whether to bind someone over for trial. If you do, then they go through a grand jury process where an indictment may be given. By the way, I think it was 29 or 30 people that went through the grand jury process. Only one of them was let go. All the rest were proceeded to trial. That tells you something interesting there. Um, and then the judges, from the beginning, presume guilt. Listen to the questions that Judge Haythorn first asks Sarah Good. What evil spirit have you familiarity with? Have you made no contract with the devil? Why do you hurt these children? What demon do you use to hurt these children? Might as well ask, when did you stop beating your husband, Mrs. Good? Right. These are leading questions that presume guilt. And this is interesting, too, because usually English justice is pretty fair and balanced. And there's no prosecuting attorney or defense attorney, but there's a panel of nine judges, nine men who've been involved in witchcraft trace cases before, including people like Goody Morse, who they refused to put to death. What happened in 1692? Why are they le giving these leading questions and assuming guilt? And again, to me, you know, why are they hanging judges? And again, it all comes back to the state of the colony. So I was really intrigued, particularly, why do the judges even turn legal precedent on its head? Because before 1692, if you confess to witchcraft, you'd be executed pretty quickly. You'd be tried, sentenced, convicted, executed. Why would people do that then, right? Well, frankly, because judicial torture was legal in Massachusetts and Europe in the 17th century. Mild torture to maybe get you to change your, uh, your, your, your plea from not guilty to guilty. Um, we know that John Proctor, while he's in jail, complains to the ministers, writes a letter saying, um, my son and the carrier boys from Andover are being treated horribly. They're being tortured. They're being tied neck and heels. You literally use a rope or a belt to tie someone's neck to their heels. You then hold them upside down by their belt around their waist till gut, blood starts gushing out their noses. It, that will not kill you, okay? It really won't, but you think it's going to, to the point where, okay, okay, maybe I was wrong about that not guilty plea, right? I mean, I kind of it's a kind of a 17th century equivalent of waterboarding, if you want to think about it, right? So, in fact, actually, interestingly too, as recently as 1688 in Boston, Goody Glover had confessed to witchcraft and had been sentenced to death, but before they carried out the execution, they had a panel of doctors uh, meet with her to make sure that she was of sane mind. Because if she was just and some adult old woman, then of course she's not a witch and we wouldn't put her to death. But unfortunately, the, the panel of doctors agreed that she's of sound mind and she's put to death. Um, well, here's my point. <laughs> In 1692, only those who refuse to confess are executed, right? There are 55 people who confessed to the capital crime of witchcraft, but were not put to death. That is over a third of the people formerly accused of witchcraft. So what's going on there? Why is the court only trying and convicting 
the people who pled not guilty. Towards the end, they start trying a couple who pled, who pled guilty. But for the most part, the only ones who end up dying, actually, all pled not guilty. Um, all 28 people fought, tried by the court, found guilty and sentenced to death. Why is that? What was going on? Well, I think, again, a lot of it has to do with the judges and who they were. And the judges, these nine judges had a lot in common. Uh, they were wealthy merchants. They were members of Ma the Massachusetts elite. Uh, they were members of the governor's council, chosen for that in the new charter of Massachusetts Bay, written by the king. So they were handpicked as the best men of the colony. Members of the governor's council today, we would call the state senate. Okay? But at the, think about this. Um, as, as state senators, they've all supported this campaign for moral reformation, and it passed a law in 1690 sort of saying, like, God is terribly angered with us. There's too much singing and dancing. We need to get back to church. Children need to get back to school so they can learn to read and to read the Bible. Government legislating morality, right? Because otherwise, with this will, God is so angry, he's going to destroy us. So that's their kind of politics, right? A, more, a, a majority of these fellows had attended Harvard, where they went to be trained as ministers, but none were ministers. Also, they are closely linked through not just high office, but also, here's the thing, all members of the state senate are also judges. So this group, this group has a lot of power, and in fact, six of the nine I did the research and found out are related by marriage. So they all have this, not just the same class interests, the same family interests, and they're very hierarchical. They take their lead actually from uh, Judge Stoughton here, the Chief Justice, and they all pretty much fall into line. And the sheriff of Essex County, of course, who's rounding people up for prison, is their nephew. So I, I, I often talk, you know, I think about the nepotism on Beacon Hill hasn't really changed all that much in 300 years, has it? These judges are all deeply involved as, as legislators in the war on the frontier between the French and the heathen Native Americans. I think these are terms that they would use, the papist French. The English were terrified of Catholics. They were terrified of Native Americans who were non-Christian for the most part. And again, they really thought that these people had allied together, these, two, these kind of agents of Satan had allied together to destroy the Puritan experiment. So this just wasn't a military disaster. It was a religious and economic disaster as well. Interesting thing. Most of the judges were high-ranking militia officers. In fact, good old Colonel Waite Winthrop here, the grandson of the great John Winthrop of City Upon the Hill fame, he was the commander-in-chief of the Massachusetts Army that was losing this war. Most of the others were officers as well. And many of them were major land speculators in frontier lands in Maine, where they owned sawmills that had been destroyed. The equivalent of, of millions of dollars of losses in property for these judges who were angry and upset and looking for someone to blame for all of their misery. Who do you blame? We can blame the government. Oh, wait, that's us. We can, okay, well, we can, we can blame the military. Wait, that's us too. Well, as Dana Carver used to say on Saturday Night Live, could it be Satan? <laughs> it's a lot, you know, human nature, it's a lot easier to look outward than to look within, right? And that's what they do. And unfortunately, they are so good at what they do that they manage to execute 19 people and lock up another 150 in prison. Well, people begin to question this pattern by the midsummer of 1692 after the second set of executions. By this time, five people have died. Another, another, um, another eight will die in September, another five in August. Um, so throughout the summer and fall. And finally, the questioning reaches the point where people start writing books about it. Particularly, Cotton Mather writes a book called Wonders of the Invisible World, which is really a, a naked defense of the government. And he only looks at parts of the evidence that defends the government and um, it's really a whitewash, right? And today, if Cotton Mather was alive, he'd be a spin doctor on the Sunday morning talk shows, you know, meet the press and stuff, defending his party, right? Um, and it's, the book is rushed to print in October so it can be sent to the king and the queen and saying, Phipps writes him a letter and it says, you know, in case you haven't heard, we've had a problem with witches, but don't worry, no innocent lives have been lost. And if you don't believe me, here's the book by the eminent Cotton Mather, graduated from Harvard at 15, minister of the North Church at 19 in Boston son of the eminent Increase Mather. Look what he says here, no innocent lives were lost. 
He only picks those cases that are the most obvious, right? He doesn't pick cases like poor Rebecca Nurse, the aged Puritan saint and grandmother, who initially has the, the jury come back with a verdict of not guilty. And then Judge Stoughton says, there were some questions you didn't ask her. Let's talk about that now, and then maybe you should think about it again. And they come back with a verdict of guilty, right? So the point is, as soon as Wonders of the Invisible World is published, Governor Phipps actually issues a publication ban. He refuses to let any more books be written on the witch trials. He says it would cause an inextinguishable flame, he tells the king and the queen. That wouldn't be a bad, that wouldn't be a good thing. He's worried. He's worried that if the truth gets out, the government will fall. If the news happens, if innocent lives will be lost, right? The king is going to recall Phipps. He's going to take the charter. He's going to create a military dictatorship, similar to what Massachusetts had faced under the dominion of New England in the 1680s. So this could be the very end of the, way, of the Puritan way of Massachusetts Bay. So I really think that in some ways what we're seeing here is the first large-scale government cover-up in American history. <laughs> it wasn't Watergate by any stretch of the imagination. The publication ban lasts, lasts three years before it's finally broken by Thomas Mall, this, this Salem Quaker who dares to write this book and tell what happened fairly straightforward and to sign his name to the book. No one in Boston will publish it, but he has it published in New York. And as soon as he comes back into the colony with his books, the books are seized, he's thrown into prison. I think all of the books were burned except one they used as evidence in his trial. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fascinating story. His trial, he's put in, in a dungeon, a prison for 11 months. Remember, five people died in the witch trials awaiting trial. So they probably figured Maul would die and wouldn't have to face trial. But when he does, we think the odds are going to be stacked against him because one of those hanging judges from 1692, Samuel Sewell, is on the bench. And one of the jurors of the 12 jurors is someone who'd convicted people of witchcraft in 1692, right? Interestingly enough, Maul is found not guilty. By 1695, the colony continued to have lots of things going wrong, and people knew that God was now angry because of the way that they treated the witches. And uh, in fact, that sort of breaks the, the logjam after Thomas Maul's book is published. Other books will be, will be soon published. After that, uh, Robert Califf, More Wonders of the Invisible World, published in 1700, and, and others. And uh, really sort of much more truthful narratives of the Salem witch trials. In other words, they really could not suppress the story. And in fact, actually, a couple of months after Maul's court case, the government finally decides now is the time to have a day of public humiliation and fasting for the sins of the colony, including witchcraft and the fact that they were deluded by Satan. They don't say, hey, you know, we were wrong, these people weren't witches, but they do say, Satan deluded us and made us think that some people were witches who maybe they weren't. Maybe we shouldn't have done that. And that's the beginning of a, of a couple of generations of effort, of, of really kind of, of, of uh, to, make, to make effort to make good to the victims of the Salem witch trials. The Massachusetts legislature regularly from that time forward, up until 1749, hears petitions from the uh, families of the victims asking for, for, for repayment of their losses, a restoration of innocency, a dropping of charges from those who had died or been convicted of witchcraft. In other words, this is something, one reason it's so well known is because people here never let it go. Also because we have almost a thousand documents. Most of these witchcraft trials in Europe, they just have a few scraps of paper. Here we have a, like a book this thick, right? Um, in fact, actually, to me, it's really interesting. Even I looked at the Revolutionary War generation and thought, looked at some of those people. And um, actually, in my book, I have this, uh, this painting. And there aren't too many books on the Salem Witch Trials, I'll admit, that have the Battle of Bunker Hill in it. Uh, but look at this picture and look who's in it. The death of General Warren. Well, there's General Warren, right? General Warren is, in fact, the great-grandson of Robert Califf, the witchcraft critic, right? And if you look over to the far side of the screen, you're going to see Colonel Israel Put uh, uh, Putnam. The Putnams were the leading family of accusers in the Salem Witch Trials in 1692. Uh, and then on the far side, Peter Salem, a slave who had his last name because he was held as a slave for part of his career in Salem. So even in paintings of the Revolutionary War, I see the Salem Witch Trials. Though my family and my former students, who some of them were in the audience, they say that, will tell you that I probably see the Salem Witch Trials everywhere, you know, occupational hazard. Um, and while many remember the witch trials, I should like to point out that it took Salem until the 300th anniversary to 1992 to build a memorial. It's a lovely memorial. I encourage you to visit it. 
But I will point out, as Susan may, uh, point, mentioned, I was a member of the Gallows Hill team who finally, <laughs> in 2016, was able to confirm the execution site. Um, that's a whole nother talk. Uh, we did it through a variety of ways of looking at the documentary record, uh, using GI GIS remote sensing, an, an asp a thing called view shed analysis. Essentially, we knew where people were standing who observed the executions, and that helped us figure out that it was not way at the top of Gallows Hill, where the water tower is in Salem, but it was much down lower on a ledge on, on lower part of, of Gallows Hill, uh, right behind the, what's now the Walgreens on, uh, on, on Boston Street. You know. Kind of unfortunate because, of course, the Walgreens is known as the corner of happy and healthy, which this is <laughs> not. Um, anyhow, um, I, was, I, was, I was thrilled that we finally had a memorial dedicated at Proctor's Ledge on July 19th, 2017, the 300th anniversary, actually, of the first mass executions, 325th anniversary of the mass executions in, uh, in Salem. And um, it, was, uh, it, was, it, was, it was really amazing to me to see all the family members who'd come from all over the country to be able to visit that site. And as I said then, you know, I'm an archaeologist who's found some pretty cool stuff, as Susan knows. Um, so people said to me, Tad, this must have been like your most amazing discovery, because it was, it was actually named Archaeology Magazine, actually named this one of the 10 top discoveries of 2016. Pretty cool, huh? Um, especially since we didn't actually involve any digging. It's all remote sensing. We did do remote sensing to see if there was anything up there, because I know everyone would want to know, well, where are they buried? It's called Proctor's Ledge because it's rock. There's no bodies up there, I assure you. It's only about this much soil. Anyhow. Um, we dedicated the memorial, and because our job wasn't to find the site, it had really never been lost. Salem has this collective amnesia where it's done its best to forget. But it's named Proctor because John Proctor's grandson owned the land in the 18th century. And throughout much of the 19th century, I don't think they ever forgot where their grandfather was executed, right? Uh, and in fact, as early as 1901, a local antiquarian, in, in S Sidney Purley, wrote an article saying, here's where it is, it's on Proctor's ledge. So our job wasn't to do that, Ours, to find it. Our job was to confirm it, which we did, and to make sure that the site was never, ever, ever forgotten again. And you can see that's the memorial just, just when, it was, uh, when it was dedicated in, in 2017. So some concluding thoughts here, right? <laughs> yeah, if you ever, how, many of we, how many of us have been to Salem and haunt, during haunted happenings, or particularly on Halloween, right? We think we're smarter today, right? You know, how could these people have been so foolish, right? Um, well, again, maybe to get mildly political. So imagine you have a powerful political leader, the supreme leader of your land, who comes to high office with absolutely no political experience. As a young man, he comes to the big city to make his fortune. He becomes one of the richest men in America by taking big risks, big losses, big wins, huge risks. Larger than life personality, known for being a deal maker, known for his coarse mouth, his lack of education, uh, his disdain for reading. His late conversion to his political cause makes even some of his supporters wonder if he's really one of them or not, right? And, and um, he also, uh, he champions though the cause of the working class and that gets him in pretty good. Now once in office, his style makes people incredibly nervous. He's, he's an uncon unconventional communicator known for his salty language, right? Doesn't always play by the rules and that quickly gets him into legal trouble. Um, in fact, he shows his, his irrational support for our mortal enemies, actively providing them aid and calling them friends. And not surprisingly, the cry of witch hunt comes to the fore. Now, as I'm sure you realize, I'm of course talking about Sir William Phipps, <laughs> the governor of Massachusetts during the witch trials. Phipps was a ship's captain, a very much a salty sailor who was barely literate, He's the first, though, to salvage a Spanish treasure galleon in the Caribbean. He becomes fabulously wealthy overnight. He becomes the hero of English America, the most famous guy in the land. Um, he's the first American to be knighted by the King of England for these efforts. He's the richest and most famous man in America. And he comes to Massachusetts, back home to Massachusetts, as his first royal governor in 1692 under the new charter of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Phipps is governor during the witch trials, and he ends them, by the way, only after his wife is accused. Yeah. He befriends the French in Acadia, who actually were spying on him, we now know. Um, when the merchants would come into Boston and the, well, they wanted to arrest him, they said, you can't arrest these fellows. I conquered Acadia, and they're as good an Englishman as you are, so leave them alone. Little did he realize they were spying and planning an invasion of Boston, we now know. And he's dogged by charges of misbehavior throughout his whole career. 
He, in uh, late 1694, he's recalled to England to answer for high crimes. And in fact, he actually dies in London uh, of, of, a, of, a, of a fever before he can defend himself. Um, so anyhow, you know, the, the parallels between the anatomy are striking, but I, let me leave you with this thought. So how, people say to me, how could they be so stupid, right? Superstitious, right? How could they believe in witches? Well, here's the thing, again, witches were all too real in 1692, right? Their goal was to destroy your faith in your society. But it's almost impossible to stop this enemy because we don't know who they are. They could be anyone. They could be friends, family, your minister. Remember I said ministers and politicians were accused. One minister was executed, right? So what do you do? How do you stop them? Your government says, don't worry, we're taking care of it. We, we're doing the best we can and it will we'll protect you, right? But you worry, right? How do they do that? Do we know for sure? Well, here's the problem, folks. If you swap the word witches in 1692 with terrorists today, you understand the problem they faced, right? Because we know that terrorists are here to destroy us. We, never, we know they could be here. We don't really think they're here, right? But you know what? If an alarm goes off or a siren goes off, our initial reaction is always oh, the darn fire alarm again. But the next side, but then, you know, if you see smoke or hear someone yell or something, maybe you go to a darker place. Oh my God, you know, has terrorism come to Newbury? Well, probably not, but again, same thing happened in 1692, right? Witchcraft, you know witches are present. When are they going to attack us? How do we stop them when we don't know who they are? It's a horrible situation to be, to be stuck with. But of course, we don't believe in witches or witch hunts, do we? Thank you very much.